I had to choose to become the curse breaker in my family. We had a many curses from poverty. Not one of my family members could ever break free from poverty. Not one. I was the one who made the decision. But it didn't happen the day thereafter. It didn't happen the year thereafter. It took my participation to make that curse broken and to continually appropriate it. Why? Because it might still be haunting me here. Thank God it's no longer here. But it might, the moment I don't guard this man, this thing can come. And I'll tell you, and I'll take it out of scripture as to why and how. It will haunt you. The curse that is on a family comes from generations before and it strengthens from one generation to another. And that is why it is the specific problems that a family will always battle with more than other problems. It is because of the force and the momentum that it has picked up over the generations. Jesus is the curse breaker. Yes, he has become a curse for us on the cross. But we have to appropriate it. And it's easy for us to say, no, but every curse is taken away. Okay, but why are you poor? Why are you sick all the time? Why this? Let's get into the reality of things. No, but in the spirit, that's fine. You need to appropriate so that it can come into the flesh. Positionally, I am with Christ in the heavenly places. High up in heavenly places. Positionally. My position in Christ. But in reality. Well let me not say reality because reality I'm there. But in our earth dimension. I might not have a saint on my name. Which means that okay. God says this is what the truth is saying. You're highly seated in heavenly places. But my, my reality is so far away. Which means that I have to begin to grow and appropriate and apply myself. God is not an automatic God. He's not a robot that's just going to do things for you. He's put the responsibility in our hands. If I want to become the curse breaker to say no more poverty in my house, I have to put myself to work. Whether it is from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night. But I slave and I work. And please, I'm not speaking of slavery. I'm preaching a bit different this morning. Is, is, is it okay? Because I've been accused to say that our church is a gambling, you know, people must just come and they'll get back. No, we have never, there's always been, you just don't record the stuff or put it on YouTube where we speak otherwise. We have how many businesses where we tell people, work. I've had people say, no, God said to me, leave my job. Then they leave their job two years later, they don't have anything. They're losing their family. Did God say, leave your job? No, the Bible says work. So God didn't say leave your job. We get super spiritual over things. He will open up a door. You know, and, and I'm doing this to help you. I know it's practical. Is it okay? But people make, they say, no, no, no. The Lord said I must leave my job. And they resign with no other prompt. Is that God? If you have kids and a wife in a time that it is now. Now it might be the exception. But then there'll be fruits. So wisdom is known by our children. Let's see if something will come forth out of that. Where God's vision is this provision. When you stay in His will, God will provide. But people step out and they're making decisions many times by becoming over spiritual and overzealous. And they don't understand, but wait, God has given me responsibilities, which is maybe my wife, my kids. And, uh, uh, and they're making wrong decisions. You know, this is not the most spiritual message, but we'll get to the curses now. But if I touch on curses without mentioning this, then it can be taken out of balance. And people can now think, okay, I just have a curse and then everything is going to be right. No, 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 no. I need to work that thing. There are forces behind this world. There are spiritual reactions. There are things that, which means that when David fought Goliath, Goliath said, I curse you by my gods. And Goliath switch the battle from the natural to the spiritual. David switched the battle from the natural to the spiritual. He says, in the name of the Lord God, whom I have a covenant with, I will take your head this day. Many had to switch it to the spiritual because power needs to be fought with power. You can't fight something spiritual with a natural. You cannot. Are you guys with me? So, 
when it comes to us, so, so many of these parts, we saw these prayer networks going up against us. The thing is that nothing comes up without resistance against it. Nothing rises without persecution. And I taught you on it, the bread rises. Why? Because of the yeast that is put upon it. And if you are the bread of Christ, you rise as a bread in an oven, in a place of fire, because of persecution, the right amount of persecution put upon you. And the Lord always told me, he says, this one's persecuting you now. In two years, they'll be gone. But at least I use them for my glory. <laughs> okay. I know that they are being used for God's glory. In one way or the other. Maybe there'll be a reward for them. For persecuting us. Because why? It makes us rise. Thank you very much. We call them employees. They're employed by us. Okay. We should actually pay them and say thank you. We did try once and they didn't want the money. And uh, so... So, this message of poverty was preached in Krugersdorp. It had a disastrous result. And it created a stronghold in the city that caused many other things to be birthed. And people lost their children to drugs. People lost their children to violence. Family, broken families began to take place. Religion began to set in. People began to no longer want anything of God. Uh, people, families are turned against one another. A lot of things have come into the city. And poverty, people began to lose jobs. Why? The gatekeepers of the city, the churches that was given the keys of death, hell, and the grave to bind and to loose the church, the ecclesia, Jesus' governmental system, the highest political group, in the realm of the spirit is the local church, the ecclesia, did not take their rightful stand. And that is why it is crucial for us as a church to say, but wait, I need to take this journey serious. When we had so much men yesterday, why? It starts with one man. It starts with a husband, a father, and a family. And 80% of that, 30% chances for that whole family to be one. If a husband and a, and, a, and, a, and a father get saved. If a wife gets saved, it's like 40% for that family to be one. If a child gets saved, it is 10% or 8% chance. Even less. Uh, but that's more or less how the stati statistics are. For that family to be one. That is why, why? You have to reach for the men. Are you guys with me? And there are many men in this city that has just become disheartened, discouraged. The power of a generational curse. There's a family called, the husband was called Max Jukes. The wife, he was an atheist and his wife was a godless woman. Now listen to this. He was an atheist, his wife was a godless woman. This is the results of the two of them in the generations after them. They had 560 descendants. 310 died in extreme poverty. 150 became criminals. 100 were alcoholic, alcoholics. Seven were murderers. More than half the women were prostitutes. Descendants of Max Dukes cost the U.S. government more than 1.25 million in the 19th century in dollars. Now I want you to look at the power of a blessing, of a generational blessing. There was a guy many of you might know, Jonathan Edwards. He was a Christian minister. Uh, he was, uh, uh, and uh, his wife was a Christian, of course. He had 1,394 descendants. Another was vice president of the United States. 294 were college graduates. 13 were college presidents. 65 were college professors. 30 were judges. 75 officers in the military. One was a dean of a law school. 100 well-known missionaries. 80 held public office. 100 lawyers. 3 U.S. senators. 3 state governors. 3 mayors of large cities. 1 uh, comptroller of the U.S. Treasury. Okay. 1 vice president of the United States. Not one descendant was a liability to the government. Not one of the descendants of the Edwards family was a liability to the government. If you follow God, if you say, I choose to become the curse breaker, 
if you can see how this blessing can begin to be multiplied and you will get blessed in heaven yes in heaven and get rewards in heaven for things that will even come after you because of a decision that you have made so it might seem insignificant to say I'm sitting in a church and I'm choosing to go to church every Sunday me and my house it might seem insignificant but you're changing a generation of the generation after you and because of that rewards are coming into your life and rewards in heaven that you will receive that is eternal some will be poor in heaven others will be rich in heaven trust me in that trust me in that the Bible is very clear have your seats outside of a vision that I had the, let's get to the Bible many will be poor and many will be rich in heaven it's not just here and heaven is temporal it's not permanent hell is temporal it's not per to permanent hell is thrown into the lake of fire which is permanent heaven will come down as new jerusalem onto a new earth that is permanent there will be natural people mm, are you guys with me okay let's leave that and that is we've done the teaching on revelation and etc but that's why i say heaven is temporal hell is temporal because how heaven will come down to a new earth hell will be thrown into the lake of fire which is permanent are you guys with me a religious spirit will only hear that now uh, only only with the temporal and they'll switch off uh, are you guys with me so 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 listen what is the definition of a curse and we are just laying a foundation this morning what is the definition of a curse it is a sin that is repeated until it becomes an iniquity I want you to I want you to understand this are you guys with me you have a transgression then you have a sin and then you have an iniquity so sin isn't just sin sin isn't somebody drinking a beer sin means missing the mark for your life the call of God stepping out of the will of God for your life that is what sin is missing the mark so when they would shoot archery in the old well still when I, I believe it's still I'm not exactly sure they would scream, or maybe it was back then, I'm not exactly sure. But when somebody would miss the mark, miss the spot, the bullseye, they would scream sin. Are you guys with me? Because the mark that was aimed for is missed. So that begs the question or brings the question now, how many of us are in sin? Are we missing the mark when it comes to our life? The dream that God has given us, the vision, the destiny that He has given us, it needs to be unlocked. You need to be in a church that is prophetic, that is apostolic, where there's the power, the spirit, and the word that can bring an unlocking of what God has put inside of you. It takes a change of three things, atmosphere, environment and association for importation to take place what is the atmosphere i find myself in what is the environment what is the local church i put myself in and what is my associations i associating with who are my friends i'll if you tell me your five friends i'll tell you your future it's better to have none than to have five friends they will be your future whether it's financially whether it is in bondage and you'll, when I get to the seven signs in a family curse right now, you're going to be shocked and it's a test. There are people that are in bondage and have become slaves today. They just don't know it. They already have masters and I'm not speaking of a demon and I'm not speaking of sin or a bondage. Are you guys with me? So, oh yeah, sorry. So you have iniquity, transgression and sin. Transgression is when I transgress the law of God and when I transgress my conscience and what the word is saying. For example, I believe it is wrong to drink. So I go now and I drink. Now, when I touch on the subject of drinking, let me say this and make this clear. The Bible doesn't say it's wrong to drink. The Bible says drunkenness is wrong. Okay. So in no way can I ever say that is a transgression or a sin because I'll be adding on to God's commandments, which is not there. Uh, when we get into the subject of sin and grace, 
I'll mess too many people up, so let me leave that one alone. Do I drink? Not a drop. Because one thing I've learned, I've watched ministers who drink. Not one. Not one. I don't care who they are. And we can mention very big names right now. We drink currently right now. Very big names. That's on TV all over in America. Some who are prophets big in America that are drinking right now. Not one of them can flow in the glory of God. Not one. So it might not mean that it is a thing that's going to send them to hell. Maybe them, because there's some requirements. Paul says as a minister, all things is lawful for me, but not all things is beneficial. But then he meant it in a way to say that there are certain things I'm not allowed to do. I do not have the right, you know, uh, 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 Rishay might have the right to do something where I might not have the right to do something by virtue of the call of God. And that comes by revelation, personal revelation. I cannot put that. The moment I put that on somebody else, it becomes legalism now. Maybe God tells me you must never watch television. If I preach that, I preach religion and legalism to you. Are you guys with me? So no way can I say that, that alcohol is a sin. Because Timothy, drink wine for your stomach's sake. But please understand it was given as a medicine bottle to him. And I'm giving this to tell you that I'm not religious when it comes to stiffness and, you know, or judging people. But I'm giving you the line between, I have to preach the truth to you. I cannot tell you drinking is a sin if it is not. But I can tell you now what it will do to your relationship with God. Okay. So, because that now touches the level of conscience. It depends on a person's conscience. As people that drink, when it comes to ministry, they cannot flow in the glory. Because the Bible says the glory of God is the new wine. It flows. In our conferences, it flows. And to have the new wine, the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine as in excess, which doesn't mean what we think it means. Uh, but be filled with the Spirit of God, singing in psalms and hymns. And, uh, you know, so that is just touching on that. But now let me, I, 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 want, I need to finish my thoughts, sorry. And we'll get to the end right now. Say with me, iniquity. Say transgression. And say sin. Sin is missing the mark. Transgression is breaking the law of God. So for some, drinking can be a transgression. Uh, transgression is something like, you know, I fall into a sexual sin. That's transgression. Transgression is stuff like that. It is what we think is sin. But when a transgression is done continually, over and over and over and over, it becomes an iniquity. And iniquity means debased and twisted and distorted. Perverse and perversion, that's what it means. So now something that was just falling into becomes a perversion in our life. And it big puts a bondage on us, but it goes further. Iniquity has the ability to go into a generational curse. A transgression not. So somebody could have transgressed that has caused an iniquity to come into their families. And that thing has become so distorted. But the thing is once, if those are not Christians, as I've read right now, some are even Christians, but they haven't appropriated themselves. That thing begins to go down the family line. And the iniquity becomes stronger because the next generation will find when that one area, people say, but no, this is just nonsense. Do you know how many people I've counseled? If they drinking, their parents drank. Or if they alcoholics, their parents were alcoholics. If their father beat up their mother, they beating up their wives. Or beating up their kids. I've dealt with grown men who would hit their five-year-old daughters. Or would wake up and they have their kids up on the wall like this. And they come out of a blackout. What do you do when you have that person sitting in front of you? They have gone to psychologists. They've gone to psychiatrists. Nothing can help them except if the presence of God comes and that curse can be broken. Because I said to him, when you were young, you made a vow and an inner vow to say, I will never be like my dad. And because you said it, you judged him. And you became exactly like the thing you judged. Are you guys with me? And these curses goes down. So, so for, for, let me just for the sake of fun, do a test that says, 
if I have these things in my family, there could be a possible curse. Do I have a pattern of constant failure? Now, some might not have some, some might not have any, some might have one. And if you have one, it doesn't mean you have a curse. But, but if some of them are making or standing out, it means there's a generational curse. Do you have a history of untimely deaths in the family and suicides or a large number of people who have died prematurely? Uh, do you exhibit a high level of anger? Anger is a huge curse when it comes in family. Do you have a high record of accidents or accidents that are unusual in nature? Like an accident, people will call you an accident pro, accidental prone or accident prone. Are you guys with me? I have a history of abuse, of physical, emotional, sexual or psychological abuse on others or there's a history of that in your past and in your family. Do you have a history of a chronic illness that never goes away and it was in the family? Constantly the same. Do you have a history of a mental illness that may have progressed through the generations? Maybe you're sitting with bipolar, your parents had bipolar, or this one was psychotic, that one was psychotic, that one battled with psychosis. It's a curse. But the chromosomes and the stuff in your head and yeah, it still needs the supernatural power of God. A curse is something spiritual that's causing a natural reaction that Christians are oblivious to. And they're fighting it with a natural and they never see results. Because we are blessed financially doesn't mean I'm not cursed. I sat with a family in the United States, the wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. Just the house was 4.5 million US in Atlanta. Huge, huge, if not more the house, huge. I mean, you, you have to have money to, to live in that area of Atlanta. And I remember being there and they asked me to urgently come and pray and there was a situation. You see, when you go to South Africa, they know South Africans have power, okay? So they like take you everywhere. I mean, I had to prophesy over how many people uh, do deliverance over how many. So from one appointment to the next person is waiting. You must go, then you just get taken from one thing. I walked into the head of, or the president of the... I think it was the AOG, it was this huge castle. And I walked into the head there uh, to go prophesy to the president of the, I think it was the AOG, I might be wrong, of the, in the whole of America. And uh, privately in his office, and it looked huge. It looked like this Oxford type offices that you see. And, and so you would take, and then from there you take to another person. And I got to this family, and they have a lot of money, but the one child committed suicide, the other child is a lesbian. The other daughter is a lesbian. The other son that is alive is trying to kill one of the daughters with an axe. In the house. And they show me the axe marks in the walls. In the... But those kids have everything they dreams, anything they desire financially. A curse can mean a lot of things. It's not just in the area of finances or in the area of health. It can hit you in relationships. It can hit you in rejection. Are you guys with me? Or you exhibit personal behaviors of you control tremendously. Or you are manipulate people tremendously. Or there's control and manipulation in your family. Or you are easily controlled or easily manipulated. Or you become a slave to somebody else because you are under their control or their manipulation. Or there's an addiction or a codependency or depression or intense rejection. Usually those things are a sign of a curse that is in the family. Are you guys with me? So, so how it happens is like I said, one person practice one thing. Now these are not the seven signs of the curses that I just preached you now. I'm gonna to get to them now and we'll be quick. Give me a few minutes, five minutes really. It's a sin, a transgression that is practiced over and over and it becomes an iniquity. It becomes twisted and perverted and it goes down the generational line. Are you guys with me? Let me read to you scriptures here. Jeremiah 17 verse five. And I want you to catch this in and take it in. We are busy with this family thing. I want us to deal with it, especially in Krugersdorp. When I say Krugersdorp, I'm not speaking down or, or discredit. I'm speaking spiritually because we are here in a mission to deal with things spiritually are you guys with me because i know once that thing is dealt with and people's attitudes and mindset is changed you'll see prosperity in your life 
you'll see change in your family. You'll see your family restored back. But it requires a spiritual fight. It requires right doctrine and right word to be preached. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man. So the cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. You can interpret it however you want. Whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. How many times have you heard or you've seen people and you, and you have a say and you say, yeah, you know, they have such a good opportunity and they just don't see it. Or as an, as an employer or as a boss, you can sit in front of somebody and you, they have such an opportunity that comes to them, but they are unable to see it. Because they've been blinded by a curse. It is like a spider's web that is over their eyes. Uh, bosses can relate to this. You, you can sit and talk to them, but it's like they're not even hearing one word. The only thing that can set them free is the power of God. Are you guys with me? But it is not against, the Holy Ghost will never work against your will. It is that person need to understand the truth, need to want and need to be hungry, need to be want to be free. And then that freedom will come. He, shall, he will not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched and dry places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Oh my God, have I seen these things come true. Are you guys with me? Um, uh, uh, I want to go to another scripture. Let's go to Lamentations, chapter number 3, verse 64. I'll be finished just now. I'm laying just a foundation. Lamentation, chapter number 3, verse 64. It's today, it's next week that we're dealing with this. Uh, and uh, to, uh, this morning, tonight, and then next week, Sunday morning, we're dealing with this. To break these things. Lamentations 3, verse 64. Listen to this. I want to give you a definition of a curse. Or what a curse is. Render unto them a recompense. Meaning, repay them. A recompense, a payment. O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow. Say with me, give them sorrow of heart. Thy curse unto them. Now listen. There is places where a curse originates from. Sources where a curse comes from. A curse comes from God. That's one source. Secondly, a curse is initiated by ourselves. Are you guys with me? Thirdly, a curse comes from the bewitchment of others upon us. Other Christians speaking against us. And or whether it's people in, in their cult. And the last thing of a curse, the way a curse comes is when a cursed object is given to you. I've had people giving me gifts and as I take it, the Lord would tell me this thing is cursed. And I would have to get rid of it. In the book of Acts, they burnt over $1.5 million of purchasing power today of books, just books and material and witchcraft objects when a revival broke out. Are you guys with me? And many of people have taken things into their houses without knowing. And we say, no, but grace, grace, grace. But there's a hidden thing that's working and that's operating and you don't know. How many times would prophesy We'll say to people, in your house, or this is buried here, there. Phone or get the person at home to go check and it's there. Are you guys with me? Now let, let's go on. So he says, give them sorrow of heart. Say with his sorrow of heart. Thy curse unto them. Meaning one of the curses that comes, it brings sorrow of heart. Your heart is just sorrow. When a Christian loses their joy, it means a curse is operating somewhere there. In the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. Are you guys with me? Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. God can persecute somebody when the curse comes from Him. But how does a curse come from God? Uh, it comes through our disobedience. Jesus became the curse upon the cross. Yet, you know, 
and we say, but in the New Testament, it's just good. Yet Peter stood in front of Ananias and Sapphira, and he said, they will carry you out right now because you have lied to the Holy Ghost. And we see an apostle speaking, cursing, announcing death and somebody dying in the new covenant, in the new testament. So this was after the cross. Are you guys with me? These were people that were in a church and they even gave financially. Just the wrong amount. That's all. They pledged more than what they could have given. That's the reality of the story. When there's a move of God, the Bible says that great fear comes upon people when there's great power. A lot of times we scream and we want revival. When a move of God comes, I, just, I, knew, a, 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 uh, um, I knew a man who was in a service of a great, the great revival that was taking place with Nikki van der Vestes and senior year. And this man was very close to him. And there was somebody in the choir. And many of you would remember those days that was just revival everywhere. And there was a man in the choir that began to speak against uh, Nikki van der Vestes and senior, the evangelist. But yet he was singing in the choir. And somebody stood up in the meeting and said, they will burn you in your face. Now it might sound religious to some and think, ah, you know, God will never act like that. A week later, somebody came, knocked on the man's door. They opened, he opened the door and they threw acid into his face. Now we have a lot of questions and say, but this is not God. And this is, I can show other things in the Bible. I want to show you different faces of God. When a move of God comes, when Peter, when Herod wanted to kill Peter the next day and cut off his head, an angel came and struck Herod because he was interfering with the move of God. When God's move comes into a city or his purpose and somebody hinders, you see a different side of God coming. Trust me on that one. That is why it is so dangerous to shut the church or this. Do you know people saying it's a good thing? Do you know how many souls have been lost to the church that's been shut last year? If you have God's heart, you will not rejoice in what was happening. I've never seen so many people backslidden. Every church losing 50% of attendance. Even here, great, there was great people that was just taken away because they were taken out of the presence of the Lord and they allowed their ears to be open for gossip. Are you guys with me? So we can get to a curse coming from God, a curse initiated by ourselves. How does it initiate by ourselves? We, we see Jacob's mother saying to Jacob, do this, act like Esau and you're going to get the blessing. And Jacob says, no, 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 I'm going to get cursed. And she says, no, 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 don't worry. Any curse that comes upon you, let it come upon me. And we see a self-initiated curse. A curse coming from God. You are cursed with a curse because of your tithes and your offerings that you have robbed me. There we see a curse coming from God. Then we obviously have those that are satanic or those that are objects. Are you guys with me? If you see this, now I gave you a test, which is one part. But now I'm going to give you the signs of a curse that is in a fact. The Lord will strike you. Say with me, strike you. With madness and blindness and confusion of heart. This is where we see this number one sign of mental illness, emotional instability and fear. Are you guys with me? Once that is in somebody's life or in a family's life, it is a curse. Emotional instability of fear and mental illness. But God can strike you with madness. Are you guys with me? Now there is a good side to all of this, okay? There's a good side to all of this, where the curse is broken, but we have to appropriate it. We became a curse for us on the cross, but I have to appropriate it. Sign number two, Deuteronomy 28 verse 21. Deuteronomy 28 verse 21. Zeranon. You know, when I said earlier about blindness, 
strike them with blindness. A lot of people have confusion. They don't know what job to take or they cannot see good things when it comes. It's, it's like there's a blindness that is on their lives. I'm not speaking of a physical blindness here. So the second sign, Deuteronomy 28 verse 21, the Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. Let's carry on. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, so with the inflammation, with severe burning, with fever, with the sword, with scorching and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. Now, some people can go out and they get a uh, cold because they are not wearing, or I can preach and I go out and I don't put something warm on and I'm in the cold air and, uh, or under air cons and I can get a cold. That doesn't mean you are cursed. It just means you are stupid. There's things, okay. Elisha, like I said, died of stomach pains. Uh, whether that was a curse or not, we can't really get into it, but there's a natural cause to certain things. So, but I'm speaking of science. How can we determine if there is a curse or not? Are you guys with me? So I'm not saying everything that is noted here is a curse, but find out or realize here that almost every area of sickness is covered here and with an extreme burning and with a sword and with a blasting and with a mildew and they shall pursue you until you perish meaning it is a sickness unto death but again I need to understand that people understand there is a first death that we will experience whether it is in a car accident dying for Christ dying of old age there's a first death that we will experience it is the second death you have to be worried about. Whether I'll end up in the lake of fire or not. It is not about my first death. This comes to everyone. It is in a Christian life. It is a graduation and a celebration of stepping from one life into your best life. That is how we see death. The Bible says God rejoices in the death of His saints. Okay, are you guys with me? So here we see hereditary and uh, hereditary sicknesses in the family as the second sign. Let's go, to, let's go to number three. Deuteronomy 28 verse 18. Deuteronomy 28 verse 18. Put it on for me quickly. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body. Say with you the fruit of my body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. We see here that barrenness and the ability not to get children is a curse. Everyone we pray for that cannot get children, get children. I have not seen a failure yet. I have not seen a failure yet to this day. Every person we pray for where the doctor said it's impossible. We pray for them, they get a child. Why? The curse is broken. Barrenness is a curse. Whether it has come upon you by something you have done or in the family, it doesn't matter. The thing is just dealing with it. It is we see female problems in this verse and then we see also when it comes to business. Are you guys with me? Let's get to sign number four. Deuteronomy 28 verse 30. Deuteronomy 28 verse 30. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not gather its grapes. We see family breakdown, divorces, broken house, and incredible debt coming in. This is, this is a sign of a family curse. Broken families is usually an iniquity that is passed on. And you'll see one broken family to another, unless you say, I choose to become the curse breaker. Are you guys with me? Children is affected by this curse specifically. It destroys them. You know, uh, uh, uh. let me just explain a broken home statistics when it comes to family breakdown. 1.2 million children, this is in the United States, are born in fatherless homes. 1.8 million children are uh, latchkey kids. If you know this phrase in the U.S., 36% of kids grow up without a father. 75% of kids on drugs come from a single parent home. In South Africa, your most 
or most of your young people that get involved into criminal activities comes from a fatherless home. Or the father is there but is absent in reality. 63% of youth suicides come from a single parent home. 70% of teen pregnancies come from single parent homes. 75% of jail juveniles come from single parent homes. Let's go to the fifth sign. Deuteronomy 28 verse 17. Almost done. Deuteronomy 28 verse 17. Cursed shall be your basket and your store, your kneading bowl. Next verse. Let's go to 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body, so with you the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, business. Go back to verse 17 again. So we see a barrenness in business. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bell, which means your bank account. We see lack, poverty, and an inability to produce as a curse. You are 45 and you've never had a job or you cannot keep a job or you're just lying on your couch or you're thinking of this great fantasy that's going to come to pass while you should be getting out of that your parents should have kicked you out when you were 20 years old but they still keep you in the house you are there's a curse that is operating are you guys with me it is by His blood that I appropriate upon my life and then I choose. It is not an automatic miracle that now I'm going to be lifted up the couch and just going out. Oh no, it, I will be, it, it, I need to appropriate it and I need to put it into action the next day. Nobody that is wealthy and prosperous just fell into it. Quick money is a curse. Are you guys with me? The problem is that when a nation gets as it is today and people become desperate, they fall for schemes. They fall for all these uh, scams, uh, you know, because they become desperate. They fall for quick, rich schemes. And we see debt coming in. Go through to Deuteronomy 28 verse 29. Almost done. Deuteronomy 28 verse 29. And you shall grope at noonday. Say with me, grope at noonday. Meaning you shall grab and you shall come and there's like just nothing. As the blind gropes in darkness, confused completely. And thou shalt not prosper. You shall grab and there's nothing like a blind person. And you shall not prosper in thy ways. And you shall be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save and come to your salvation and help you. It means a curse is operating. Are you guys with me? And it speaks of incredible debt. In fact, the Bible equals debt to slavery and bondage and selling your children to become prostitutes. That's what Nehemiah said when he said you want to tax your people so much that you make them debtors and that they are indebted to you. They have sold their children into slavery and prostitution. So sign number six, Deuteronomy 28 verse 29, we are there. And you shall grope and prosper and there will be nobody to save you, but you shall grope in blindness. You end up with no vision, no ambition in life. No dream and no direction. You will always have the words that says, uh, Prophet, I don't know what to do with my life. What do you mean you don't know what to do with your life? Where's the dream? Where's the desire? It's not natural. It's spiritual. Something has clouded that and has taken ambition. Do you know how many times people have told me, I don't know the call. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I, I say to them, people say, I don't know what my call is. I say, what do you want to do? I don't know what I want to do. Yet of it, the devil must come out. It's not normal. It's not natural. That tells you there's a spiritual problem with this thing. A thing that needs to be broken. But unless that person recognizes, sees and realizes this is a curse. You see, how does deliverance take place? A devil must be identified. When you see us cast out devils, it is because the devil has been identified. When you cast out a devil in a person, you have to identify. The only way you can identify it is with light. The light of the word. But light in your eyes. Are you guys with me? Last sign. Deuteronomy 28 verse 43. Deuteronomy 28 verse 43. The alien who is among you shall rise higher. And higher above you and you shall come down lower and lower the stranger let me use a different word the stranger that is around you shall go higher and higher and you will go down lower and lower now listen to this next next carry on he shall lend to you 
but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head and you shall be the tail. What is happening in South Africa? Other nations, aliens, strangers are coming in and they're lending to this nation. And this nation is lending to nobody. Why? The moment you lend somebody money, you become their master. They become your slave. It is the oldest trick in the book. Are you guys with me? The moment you have power over that person. That's why when we say that this nation has been bought, it's been bought long ago already. And they have to delay things and instigate things to say certain things coming from here. So that the agenda can be finished. South Africa has a huge play when it comes to the end of the age. And please, we're not at the end of the world, we're at the end of the age. The signs are clear. Don't say, oh, you know, people have been preaching it all the time. That's fine. Even Paul preached it. So close it was already then. Paul preached it. Peter preached it. Jesus preached it. Are you guys with me? When it comes to the end of the age, we are in the church age, the church of the Lucia, which is the last church age, meaning we are at the moment where it is the return of Christ, but is waiting for a revival. The Bible says the heavens is holding him back. And it is grace that is given to us so that the time can be redeemed. And say with you the redemption of time. Say it again. Say the redemption of time. There is a, there is a, uh, a um, redemption of time that has to come in. The Bible says, redeem the time for the day of evil is coming. Are you guys with me? There's an evil day that comes upon every person. I don't care if life has been going good for you. There's a day when it can feel like the rug will just be pulled out under you. And unless you have redeemed the time, taken opportunity and prepared, and then you have the supernatural side, that day will overtake you and you will not be prepared. That is why we preach certain things. That people can say, but wait, I want my eyes to be open. I want to be prepared. I want to take responsibility for my family. I want to be a Christian that prosper. Because God rejoices in the prosperity of His saints. Oh, God rejoice. No parents rejoice if their young child wants something, but they cannot give it to them. They have to give them something they cannot afford. Something small. No parent rejoices in that. How much more God? Do you know that if you give your child a gift and they are so happy and they hug you and they can't stop hugging you, you feel like you want to give them another one? I'm not speaking of older kids now, okay? I'm speaking of younger kids. Uh, but you feel like you, this is how God works with gifts. Don't ever think that God's mind is not to want to prosper. He wants to see you prosper. If I don't want to see my kids prosper, something is wrong. I should not be a parent. How much more our heavenly father? If we have good fathers on this earth, how much more of a good father is he in heaven? Which tells you that if there's anything that is poverty or where there's lack, it is not of God. It's not his will. And the scripture we just read where it says you shall lend but you shall not borrow to somebody else. You will become a slave in bondage. You will be easily, you will be owned by somebody. This is a curse that needs to be broken. Say this with me. Say he became a curse. He took rejection upon the cross so that I can be accepted. He took poverty so that I can prosper. He took sickness so that I can be healed. As much as what salvation was brought to me, the curse, He became the curse. He became sin. Are you guys with me? Which means I have to appropriate it. I cannot do this thing if I don't have Christ in my life. The day of evil can come. And everything can be ripped out in front uh, under me. We're in a reality with this nation where you cannot do anything. You cannot put your hope in anything except the blessing of God. And the blessing, you need the blessing. Whatever business deal, whatever job you have, whatever work you do, whatever ministry you do, you need the blessing of God upon it. The breath of God upon it. 
Because in that day, every work we do will be put to the test in front of Him in the day of judgment and it will be burnt by fire. And if it was not of Him, it will just be burnt and nothing will be left. If it was of Him, it will remain and will be given a reward for that.